Returning home from my office, I found my house replaced by a gaping pit ringed with teeth and a roving slime slick tongue. So if anyone has seen a two-story Tudor style home, I'm offering a reward. These are the recordings of Dr. Cornelius Plink. So, concerning these recordings, I was encouraged by acquaintances to purchase one of these phonographic contraptions so that I might record my observations about our town. I'm flattered to have been chosen by prominent Arkham citizens to be the chronicler of our town's events. Arkham is certainly unique in my experience and worth experiencing, even if it is from some remote location and time. In fact, it's probably wisest to experience Arkham in that fashion. A contingent of young Italian men brought one of the number to my office just as I was closing up. I rather suspect that they are what is known as rum runners and have been in a quote-unquote dust-up with a rival gang. They asked me to keep their colleagues' injuries off the record, which I am willing to do. While writing up the bullet wound would be easy, I have no idea how I would explain the giant circular marks that were imprinted into his flesh. Mrs. Backland came by complaining once again about pains in her lower back. I can find no evidence of sciatica, breast nerves, or injury in that region, and I rather suspect that she is lonely and comes to my office for the momentary companionship. I certainly don't begrudge her this, except that she talks so much. That woman can turn a conversation into a bastille of social obligation. I dare not turn her out, however, seeing as how her husband is a clerk in town hall. Not that town hall, the real one one that casts a long shadow even when it's noon and the sun is directly overhead. Speaking of shadows, have any of you noticed the shadows cast by those street lights along the west end of River Street? I swear to you, those shadows do not move, no matter how much one cares to come over to rum. They just lay on the sidewalk like solid things, and I swear that one of them is shaped just like me. I avoid going there at night now, because I find myself terribly tempted to stand at the feet of that shadow. My shadow. And find out just how tightly we fit together. The search for a nursing aid for my office continues. The latest, Mrs. Parsnip, was efficient enough if a touch cool with the patients. Granted, some of the people that walk through my door as drop-ins are indeed mixed up in circumvention prohibition or have a third eye carved into their foreheads. Still, that's no call for bad manners. Unfortunately, Mrs. Parsnip was a victim of a bizarre water closet accident. I never would have guessed that the toilet could back up with such tremendous force. Perhaps you read about it in the papers. Bon voyage, Mrs. Parsnip. I hope those on the other side of the veil greet you in a warmer fashion than you greeted my patients. At least my home is well organized. Thank goodness for Miss Aquina Widamu, a Wampanoag woman, don't you know? She's a bit bossy, but as I understand it, her people kept alive something of a matriarchal society, God help them. So I suppose it's an inherited trait. I have no complaints. My house is spotless, and she keeps me up to date on my bills. She does insist on having her grandmother perform some sort of cleansing ritual on my offices once a month, which makes the building rattle in a rather violent fashion which is a bit off-putting. On the other hand, she makes a wonderful butternut squash soup. And how are you, listeners? Any ailments I should know about? Joints that ache in wet weather? Perhaps a cough that you cannot kick? Are you drawn to a shadow in your exact shape, just laying there on the ground waiting for you to join with it to create a whole being that is divined by an unending hunger? that will send you stumbling out into the world, biting and chewing you. Ah, yes, thank you, the sweeter move. Quite all right now. I have continued my research into the peculiar round marks found on the torso of the rum runner. The only reference I can find that comes close to those marks are the suckers found on the tentacles of the cephalopoda, specifically the octopoda. But according to this research, an octopus large enough to leave marks of such a size are simply not found in nature. It would be 
quite the scientific find to dig up the creature that left its calling card on that young man. Of course, that would mean further communications with a violent gang of illegal alcohol merchants. Should I pursue this? Perhaps some butternut squash soup while I make a pro and con list. It appears I've been sleepwalking. I woke up, as it were, last night on River Street. I have not known such fear since the war. I thought that the shadows had finally laid total thing to me, that I would merge with the standing shadows so perfectly suited to my own shape. But then I realized that someone had smashed all the old style street lights. Never have I been so relieved to find myself in an all blanketing darkness. I do not know who broke those lights. But if you hear my voice, my good sir, you have my eternal thanks. A state tourist council from Delaware sent me a letter asking me for a written endorsement, extolling the beauty of their state. Apparently, I am some sort of joke to them. I have been further considering our octopus enigma. When that young man was brought in, his comrades in arms would merely say that he had been hurt in, quote, an incident, unquote. Bullet wounds sustained in the incident indicates a fight, or an accident involving friendly fire. The key point, though, is the word incident. It is singular, not plural. This suggests that both the bullet wound and the sucker marks occurred in the same moment. Question. If the singular incident was either an attack or a friendly fire incident, does that mean the sucker marks were the results of some sort of weapon? Further research is required. After a break for some more of Miss Wiedemu's butternut squash soup, I ventured past the square at Armitage and Federal yesterday. You know the one. It was late afternoon, and a most pleasant evening sun was laying a thick golden light upon the closely trimmed grass. The children were playing, the tame dogs were romping, our parents were seated on their benches and catching up on the local gossip. I crossed through the park along the cement path and noticed that towards the southeast is a dead patch. No grass or shrubbery grows there. I watched a squirrel come up to that barren patch of gray earth, inspect it, take the long way around. Curious, I bought a pack of peanuts from Mr. Pacino at his cart. I just shelled a handful of the nuts and scattered them across the bat patch. When do you know it? No crows flew down. No pigeons swarmed the area. The aforementioned squirrel climbed halfway down a tree, gave the nuts a longing look, then returned to its higher branches. Upon closer inspection, I noted that even insects stopped at the edge of the earth, and forming a line, marched around it. I shall return with sample jars for examination back in my office. I suppose I could just use the peanut packet and scoop up some of the odd earth with my bare hand. But I might get dirt out of my fingernails, and what's a physician with dirty fingers? It's nice to see that the sky is all patched up again, after that piece almost hit me a couple of weeks back. You have to give town hall this much, and they're efficient. I've analyzed a sample of dirt from the park at Armitage and Federal Streets. You've been there. As far as I can tell, there's nothing wrong with the soil. But at the same time, there's nothing right. The earth contains no contamination that I can detect with my equipment here. It also contains no nutrients. It just... is. None of which explains why animals avoid that patch. The bigger question is... Were all the humans also avoiding that patch? And if so, was it deliberate or subconscious? I believe the war between the various gangs involved in alcohol smuggling is escalating. Three men came into my office just at closing time yesterday. If I understand the situation correctly, they are members of a gang that rivals the young men that came in before. I was unable to help the man of this most recent trio as he had been exposed to something that had driven him quite mad. Sanity is well outside my range of expertise. I refer them to the asylum, where they will do their very best to put the man's troubled mind at rest. His two compatriots said that their colleague had been a captive of the other gang, that he had been exposed to the pages of a book as an experiment. I am worried that this purported book will be an edition of the much maligned Encyclopedia Terrorificus which will give would-be censors more ammunition for their campaigns. 
as I've stated before, I am dead set against censorship. However, I am beginning to wonder if the library should consider moving the volumes of the encyclopedia out of the children's section, or at least away from the area near the guinea pig cage, as that creature has a noticeably enlarged cranium and has attempted to pick the lock. I have heard that there is some tension at the docks. The ship owners have called in new workers from Innsmo to clean and repair the bottoms of the ships. Local workers have been supplanted and are not pleased about it. I understand the locals' concerns, but one must admit, it must be nice to having ship workers who can stay underwater for hours at a time with no breathing apparatus. I suppose I should alert someone about the strange patch of earth in the park at Armitage Federal, but that would mean interacting with Town Hall. The real Town Hall. No. Oh. It just occurred to me. What if Town Hall, the real Town Hall, already knows about that patch. What if they don't want anyone talking about it? Perhaps I'll take a moment and think this over. A nice bowl of butternut squash soup seems like just the ticket right now. Last night, I heard footsteps around my house. From the sounds of it, from multiple bodies. No voices, just the sound of grit being turned underfoot, or under feet. I went downstairs and called out the window, asking who was there. There was no reply. Just the sound of those steps growing closer, seemingly coming from all sides of the house. I quickly repaired to my kitchen and armed myself with my largest carving knife, the squirreled silver one I used to carve turkeys and pheasants and holidays. I could not tell who was outside, or who might wish me some kind of devilment. Doctors are always targets for those that wish to acquire the drugs and medicines we have on hand but perhaps those steps belong to members of one of the rum-running gangs I had previously helped, now angry with me for aiding and abetting their competitors. And of course, this is Arkham, so those footsteps. Well, perhaps they didn't belong to mischievous men at all. I waited in the dark of my kitchen, smelling like fear, feeling the sweat drip from my temples and down the small of my back. I had been a medic during the war, but I had learned enough in training to dish out violence if it was required of me. Those footsteps surrounding me came closer, closer. Surely now they were just outside my windows. And then, nothing. The steps stopped. I heard nothing. Then perhaps the faintest sound of a scuffle. I waited some minutes, then ventured forth to carefully stick my head out the front door. I saw nothing. I heard nothing. The threat, such it was, had departed. Vanished to the night. Well, I did see Miss Weedemoo passing by with some of her brothers. I waved to her and bid her to hasten home for safety's sake. But as for the danger, it was gone. Hopefully for good. A happy day. I delivered the newborn of Mr. and Mrs. Lewandowski. We had some concerns as Mrs. Lewandowski had a troubled pregnancy, with excessive back pains and exuding an inexplicable odor of sulfur. But I'm elated to report that the child, a boy, is in grand health. Ten fingers, ten toes, healthy heart and lungs, and I find the slitted pupils to be quite charming. Welcome to the world, Maximilian. Yes. I see there's very little room left on this phonographic cylinder. So I shall leave you here, dear listener, with this advice my grandfather once gave unto me. Moss does not always grow on the north side of trees, so do not count on it to guide your way. In fact, don't count on moss at all. As far as plant life goes, it is of a very low character. Overnight for Observation is created by Daniel Fox. Daniel is the author of the horror novel Mash Your Motor. <laughs>